Greetings and welcome to a series of lecture on intermediate algebra, equations and inequalities in one variable. In this lesson, we will concentrate on products. Before we begin jumping into the topic of taking products, multiplication, let's discuss and refresh properties of real numbers. Starting off with the commutative property of addition. That all means that if we have two real numbers, A and B, A plus B will result in the same thing as B plus A. We can commute, change the positions in addition, and the result is exactly the same. For example, 2 plus 3 is the same thing as 3 plus 2. The commutative property of a multiplication very similar to the commutative property of addition, but with multiplication means if we have two real numbers, A and B, that will be the same thing as B times A. It doesn't matter which order we do multiplication in, the result is the same. Now, I want to stress that this is over addition and multiplication, not subtraction and division. But with subtraction and division, we can change a subtraction problem to the addition of the opposite. And a division problem, we can change to a multiplication of the reciprocal. So as long as we rewrite the problem in terms of addition and um, or multiplication, then we can utilize the commutative property. The associative property of addition just means we can regroup a plus the quantity B plus C will equal the quantity A plus B plus C. So it doesn't matter in which we group. We can regroup to help us perform um, addition. Likewise, over multiplication, we can regroup. And it will result the same thing. If we multiply A times B first, then C that will be the same thing as multiplying B times C first, and then A. Let's just take a look at the example 5 times the quantity 4 times X. Now you might be just jumping to the conclusion that that is, oh, uh, 20X. But the reason we can do it is we can regroup. Right now, according to my order of operations, I have to do what's inside the parentheses first. 4 times X. Well. Okay, 4 times x, but I don't know what x is. Therefore, there's not much that I can do inside there. So either you can, can, you can think of it as I've already done it, and then I have to multiply that by 5. But again, what, is, what does it mean to be 5 times 4x? Well, if we regroup it, and instead of 5 times the quantity 4x, and we regroup it to where it's 5 times 4, then times x, we know what 5 times 4 is. Now I know you're probably jumping automatically to the 5 times 4 part, but it's because we have the associative property that we're permitted to do that. Let's attempt another problem, a little bit more difficult because it has a fraction involved. But let's simplify 1 4 times the quantity 4a. Now again, we're supposed to be doing what's inside the parentheses first, but it's not really helpful because there's not much I can do about a 4a. But if I regroup and say 1 fourth times 4, then a times a, then I can have 1 fourth times 4 over 1. 1 times 4 is 4. 4 times 1 is 4. And therefore, 4 over 4 is 1. And we wouldn't write it as 1a. We would just say a. There's an implied 1 there. Now, what I would do is take this next example, 12 times 2 thirds x, and uh, pause the video and try and do it yourself according to the associative property. Yes, you can just look at the numbers and multiply the numbers, but according to the rules, you must regroup first. So now it's 12 times 2 thirds times x, 12 over 1 times 2 over 3, x, 12 
12 times 2 is 24, 1 times 3 is 3, and 24 over 3 is 8, so the result is 8x. Let's take another problem, 6 times t over 3. Now occasionally, however the problem is written, might trip you up. Because if I regroup this, now I have 6 times t over 3. Did that really help me? Well, there's really a number in front of the t. It's a 1. So there's no rule that, can't, that doesn't say I can't bring the 1 third out front of the t. So since it's 1 third times t, I can now regroup the numbers. 6 times 1 third. And 6 times 1 third is 6 over 3, leading to 2t. Another example might be you have the variable on the outside of the parentheses, and then you have a number in another variable, or the same variable, on the inside of the parentheses. We can still regroup. We can still regroup. It's still going to help us to regroup. Well, x times 2 over x is the same thing as x times 2 times 1 over x. Bring that 2. I can, if this is over multiplication, I can use our commutative prop property to rearrange our values. So I have 2 times x times 1x, uh, 1 over x. And I could do the math for the x's first. 2 times x over x. Now I am making a good, uh, a, a giant assumption here. I'm going to assume x is not 0. If x is 0, this falls apart, but if, as long as x is not 0, this doesn't fall apart. x over x is going to be 1. 2 times 1 is 2. Now we've looked at associative property of addition, associative property of multiplication, commutative property of of addition and commutative property of multiplication. Let's take a look at one more property, distributive property. Distributive property means that you can distribute multiplication over addition, meaning a times the quantity b plus c equals ab times ac. So we distributed, distributed the a to the b and to the c over this addition. Yes, it could be subtraction too, because of course we can write subtraction as addition, so therefore it's good over subtraction too. Let's take an example. 5 times the quantity 4x plus 3. Now according to my rules of operation, I need to do the parentheses first, but there's really nothing that I can simplify in 4x plus 3. So, I would need to get rid of those parentheses. But before I do that, this 5 is getting multiplied to everything on the inside. That's where distributive property helps. We're going to distribute this 5 to both terms in the parentheses, the 4x and the 3. So now it becomes 5 times 4x plus 5 times 3. Now, using our regrouping, we can regroup the 5 and the 4 together and do that multiplication first. And it's going to end up being 20x plus 15. Now I know I will start skipping regrouping and just do the multiplication. But it is not the distributive property that I'm using. A lot of Students think that this is a distributive property. It's not. I'm dis the distributive property clearly states that it's distributing multiplication over addition. In this circumstance, sorry, 5 times 4x, there's no addition there. So it really isn't the distributive property. It is the associative property that we're going to use. Let's crank it up a notch and throw in some fractions. Those always seem to trip people up. So 1 half times the quantity 3x plus 6. Again, the first thing you need to look at is can I do anything in that parentheses? Can I simplify it? And if the answer is no, you go to the next phase, which 
I have one half times this quantity, so I am going to distribute the one half to each term inside the parentheses, so one half times three x, one plus one half times six. One half times three is three halves, and one half times six is six over two, but I can reduce the six over two, and I do want to do that, so my final is three over two x plus three. Now it doesn't really matter if my numbers are fractions or decimals. Uh, the process is still the same. I'm still going to distribute whatever multiplying whatever, uh, whatever is multiplying the quantity inside the parentheses. I am going to distribute it. So 0 0.09 times the quantity x plus 2,000. Again, I'm going to distribute the 0 0.09 to both terms in the parentheses. 0 0.09 times x and 0 0.09 times 2,000. I'll just do that math, 0.09x plus 180. Now, it doesn't mean that you always have to have a constant value on the outside, a number on the outside. You could have a variable. It still works. We still can use the distributive property. This time I have x times the quantity 1 plus 2 over x. I'm going to distribute that x over the 1, uh, the times the 1, as well as the 2 over x. So x times 1 plus x times 2 over x. Giving me x plus 2x over x, and then of course I want to reduce again. I am assuming that x is not 0 because we don't want 0 in the denominator. Now when we're working with anything with negatives or subtraction in our parentheses, we do want to be exceptionally careful about uh, making sure that we're multiplying negatives correctly. So here's an example, negative 3 times the quantity 4x minus 2. Now again, I'm still going to distribute, but this time the whole entire negative 3 is going to be distributed to the 4x and to the 2. Negative 3x times 4x minus, that's the minus inside the parentheses, negative 3 times 2. Okay. Negative 3 times 4x is negative 12x. Negative 3 times 2 is negative 6, so I have negative 12x minus negative 6. And the minus negative 6 is really the opposite of negative 6, which is positive 6. So our result, negative 12x plus 6. You really got to watch the, the, um, the negatives there. It's really super easy to drop one. It's easy to leave one off. Perhaps you only gave it to the first term, but you forgot the second term. Yeah, it's really simple to drop a, a negative, and then the answer is wrong. So be really careful when you're dealing with subtraction or negatives. So here's a strange looking one. Negative parentheses 6a uh, minus 4. Very strange looking, but we can help ourselves out here. If we remember there is a coefficient in front of here. It is a 1. So let's go ahead and write it. Negative 1 times the quantity 6a minus 4. Now I'm going to distribute the whole entire negative 1 to the 6a and the negative 1 to the 4. This subtraction came from the parentheses. So negative 1 times 6a is negative 6a. Negative 1 times 4 is negative 1, so I have negative 6a minus negative 4. And a minus negative 4 is really a plus 4. So negative 6a plus 4. Now, we want to start combining terms. But the only way that we're going to combine terms is if they are similar. Think of it like this. If I say I have three cats, and four cats, how many total cats do I have? Well, I have three cats plus four cats, so I have seven cats. But if I have a tiger and a lion, 
Well, I have one tiger and one lion. I'm not going to combine those, like add them together. If I add them, I don't get a new species. If I multiply them, I do. If I breed them, I do. But if I add them, I don't. Think of it like this. I have six buckets and I have 10 pens. What do I have? Well, I have six buckets and I have 10 pens. But if I have 10 pens and three pens, how many pens do I have? 13 pens. As long as they're the same thing, I can combine them. So similar terms are terms with the same variable part, but not just the letter. It has to be the power two. The exponent has to be exactly the same. So 2y and 7y are similar terms. x squared y and negative 1 half squared y are similar terms. They both have an x squared, they both have a y. x cubed y squared and x squared y cubed are not similar. Sure, they both have x's. Sure, they both have y's. But they don't have the same exponents connected to that variable. Yeah, one has a 3, one has a 2, one has a 3, one has a 2. But it has to be on the same variable. So the variable has to be the same along with the power of the variable. So here's the reason why we want to know what a similar term is. Because with, when I said three cats and four cats, that was kind of simple for us to say, well, the total amount of cats is seven. I mean, I can count them. With variables, sometimes it's a little more difficult to figure out if they are similar. If it is a cat and a cat, is it an x and an x or an x and an x squared? Well, an x and an x squared is like the tiger and lion combination. Those you're not going to add together. But a tiger and a tiger, an X and an X, you can combine. So here's the formality of it. Let's try 3X plus 5X. Technically, I can use my distributive property. So 3X plus 5X, they have something in common. I can factor out, and we'll talk about factoring in a second. Factor out the X, and now I have 3 plus 5. I can add 3 plus 5. 3 plus 5 is 8. Now, you can either think of it as distributive property and do the formal steps of taking the x out, what they have in common, and then you can see 3 plus 5. Or you can think of it as a whole entire thing, like 3 cats and 5 cats. If there are 3 cats and 5 cats, I have a total of 8 cats. This just so happens to be 3x and 5x, and therefore I have 8x in the end. Now I did kind of mention something about that tiger and that lion. I said I can't add them, but I can multiply them. So on that train of thought, let's start talking about multiplication properties of exponents. Our first property, a to the r times a to the s, where R and S are, are whole numbers, my result would be A to the R plus S. Here's a good example. 2 squared times 3 squared. Well, if I wrote that out long way, that's 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. How many 2's do I have? Well, I have 5. And that's the same thing as 2 plus 3, and therefore 32. It works with variables as well. x fourth, x to the fourth is x times x times x times x. x to the fifth is x times x times x times x times x. How many total x's do I have? Well, I have 4 plus 5, 9. So if we add the exponents, then it saves us a lot of work of having to write out x times x times x, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Right? We're going to use this property that a to the r times a to the s will equal a to the r plus s. 
Now, a little bit different. A to the R to the S. So a power raised to a power is going to be A to the R times S. So a to the r, which is already to a power, raised to another power is going to be those powers multiplied. For example, 2 squared, all of that cubed. Now if I wrote it out, it's going to be 2 squared times 2 squared times 2 squared. And that brings us up to property number 1, and that's 2 plus 2 plus 2, which is 6. Or we can jump to use this property and say, well, 2 squared cubed is 2 to the 2 times 3, 2 to the 6, which is 64. Let's try it with a variable, x. x to the 4th to the 5th is going to be x to the 4th times 5, which is x to the 20th. Now, of course, you're not going to want to write out x to the 4th, x to the 4th, x to the 4th, x to the 4th, x to the 4th. And then, if you didn't have property 1, you'd literally have to write x, 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 x. You get my point. You'd have to write it out literally 20 times and then count them and say, oh, I have x times itself 20 times, and therefore it's x to the 20th. Yeah, using these properties will save us a whole bunch of paper, ink, and time. A third property for exponents is when we have a quantity, a times b, and that whole entire quantity is raised to the r, any number power, right? That will turn into a to the r, b to the r. Here's why. Uh, let's take an example, 3x. 3x squared is going to be 3x times 3x. I could put the numbers together, so that's 3 times 3. I could put the x's together, x times x. Well, 3 times 3 is 3 squared, and x times x is x squared. So pretty much we give this exponent to both quantities, or however many items we have in the parentheses, we get to distribute. It's still technically distributing, but I'm going to go ahead and call it that. We get to distribute to everybody inside the parentheses. So 3 squared times two squ uh, x squared. 3 squared is 9, so 9 squared, uh, 9 x squared. Let's try 2x cubed to the 4th. Well, we're going to distribute this 4th power to the 2 and to the x cubed. 2 to the 4th times x cubed to the 4th, which from our previous property, I get to multiply the, the um, exponents. So it's 16x to the 12th. All right, so we talked about properties, commutative property, associative property, distributive property. We've talked about properties for exponents. Now we're going to start bringing that all together. So let's get some definitions out of the way. Monomial. Monomial is one term expression that is either a constant, just a number, or the product of a constant and one or more variables raised to a whole number exponent. For example, negative 3. That's a monomial. 15x is a monomial. Negative 23x squared y is a monomial. 49x to the fourth y squared z to the fourth is a monomial. And 3 fourths a squared b cubed is a monomial. As long as all I have is multiplication in between these values, it is a monomial. Now, coefficient is the numerical part of each monomial, meaning term. A monomial is a term, one term in expression. So, there is no, uh, for negative 3, there is no variable part, and therefore it's just a constant. Negative 3 is just a constant. With 15x, the coefficient is 15. With negative 23x squared y, the coefficient is negative 23. 49x to the fourth y squared z to the fourth, the coefficient is 49. And for 3 fourths a squared b cubed, the coefficient is 3 fourths. All right, let's walk through an example. We're going to multiply two monomials. 
negative 3x squared, and 4x to the third. What I can do is regroup it using our associative property and reorder it using our commutative property of multiplication. So I'll have negative 3 times 4, x squared times x cubed. Now the negative 3 times 4 isn't the hard part. Is we do need to remember our exponential rules, our properties for exponents, when we have x squared times x cubed. x squared times x cubed means I add the exponents. So my result is going to be negative 12 x to the fifth. Another example, negative 2 x squared cubed 4 x to the fifth times 4 x to the fifth. Right. Again, first step is going to be to distribute this power to everything inside the parentheses. I'm still kind of working with my order of operations, parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, that type of thing. I'm still working in that realm of uh, order of operations. So I do have to take care of the exponential first. So I'm going to distribute the power 3 to the negative 2 and to the x squared. Negative 2 cubed is negative 8. x squared cubed, well, is x to the 2 times 3. 2 times 3 is 6. Now, again, I'm going to reorder my, uh, my problem so I can get all my coefficients together and my variables together. Negative 8 times 4 times 6 to the 6, or x to the 6th power, oh, and x to the 5th power. And now I get uh, negative 8 times 4 is negative 34. x to the 6 times x to the 5th would be x to the 6 plus 5, resulting in negative 32 times x to the 11th. Dry mouth. Sorry about that. Let's talk about what it means to be a polynomial. That was monomial. Now a polynomial is just an infinite sum of monomials. Okay. Polynomial with two terms would be something like x plus 2, uh, x squared plus negative, or, or uh, x squared minus 45. So it's just over like addition and subtraction separates terms. So a polynomial is an infinite sum of those. And we do have very special words. When I have two terms, it's a binomial. When I have three terms, it's a trinomial. Mathematicians, for whatever reason, we like to give things to two and three special names like x squared, x cubed. Two, uh, a polynomial of two terms is a binomial, and a polynomial of three terms is a trinomial. Polynomial of four, term, of four terms is, well, polynomial of four terms. No special name there. So let's take a look at a few of them. <clears throat> Example of a trinomial, three terms, 3x squared plus 2x plus 1. Another trinomial could be 15x squared y plus 12xy squared minus y squared. And a polynomial of four terms, 3a minus 2b plus 4c minus 5d. Now let's start to multiply our polynomials with a monomial. So the monomial is on the outside, a polynomial is on the inside. We're going to use our distributive property. I'm going to need to multiply every term in the parentheses by what's on the outside of the term. 3x squared multiplied by 2x squared. 3x squared multiplied by 4x. 3x squared multiplied by 5. And I'm going to use all those rules that I used before when I was dealing with a monomial times a monomial. And I'm not going to rewrite it in the grouping of the numbers. I'm just going to do it mentally in my mind. 3 times 2 is 6 x squared times x squared is x to the fourth. 3 times 4 is 12. x squared times x is x cubed. I'm adding those exponents. 
3 times 5 is 15, and x squared, nothing else to multiply it to, so it comes along for the ride. Now working with a polynomial multiplied with a polynomial, we do have that nice uh, technique of foiling, F-O-I-L, to keep everything in track, it, that we've completed all the multiplications that we need to, to complete. So with using two polynomials, of a binomial of each, I'm going to make sure that I multiply everything in the first polynomial by everything in the second polynomial. FOIL will help you remember what you've done and what you still have left to do. FOIL, firsts, multiply the first term, 3x to the other first term, 2x. Outer, O for outer, multiply 3x by the outer term of negative 1. Now the inners, multiply negative 5 to the 2x, and finally multiply negative 5 to the negative 1. And you might be asking why I grabbed the whole entire negative 5 here and negative 1. To me, it's easier to keep track if everything, uh, if the signs go along, I know I'm not going to drop anything, but I do have to create addition in between all my multiplications. Now that might change later on when I do my multiplication, but they're just little placeholders for now. Okay, 3x times 2x is 6x squared. 3x times negative 1 is negative 3x. There was a placeholder. Negative 5 times 2x is negative 10x, another placeholder. And negative 5 times negative 1 is positive 5. I'm going to combine like terms. Those monomials that have the same variable with the same variable power. So negative 3x minus 10x is negative 13x. So 6x squared minus 13x plus 5. Now let me formally state the rule for multiplying polynomials. To multiply two polynomials, you multiply each term in the first with each term in the second. I've said that, but this is formally saying it, that it is a rule. We've also kind of discussed the FOIL method. Here's a different way of looking at the FOIL method, which is kind of a vertical off to the side, doing my work off to the side method. So let's take 2x plus 3 times 5x minus 4. I'm going to multiply the first terms, 2x and 5x. Well, 2x and 5x gives me 10x squared. Get myself out of the way there. The outer terms come next, 2x times negative 4. 2x times negative 4 gives me 8x. 3, uh, positive 3 times 5x. Those are the inner terms. 3 times 5x is 15x. And positive 3 times negative 4 are the last terms, gives me negative 12. Now it might be easier to see in a vertical pattern what you need to combine. I have negative 8x's and 15x's, so I'm going to combine them to make 7x's. So my final result, 10x squared plus 7x minus 12. Sometimes it might be a little easier to actually multiply vertically, like we do with uh, 27 times 14. We multiply vertically. When we have like a trinomial and a binomial or or a uh, polynomial of four terms and a polynomial of three terms. It can get really messy when you're foiling, trying to keep track of everything. So multiplying vertically might be a helpful setup for you to keep everything straight. Very similar to multiplying something like 27 and 14. I'm going to take the four in the 17, or uh, in four in the set 14 and multiply to every term, the ones and the tens, and if I add more, and then I'm going to take the one in the 14 and multiply it with a little spacer, a uh, placeholder, and use that same technique to multiply two polynomials. But instead of just multiplying numbers, I'm going to multiply the whole entire term. Here's what I mean. I line up my polynomial with the most terms on top. Just like if I had 112 times 47, I would line up the 112 on top. And then my second polynomial. I'm going to take the first 
In other words, the rightmost term in the bottom polynomial and multiply that to every term in the top polynomial. Negative 3y times 4y squared is negative y, oh, negative 12y cubed. Taking negative 3 times y to negative xy, I get positive 3xy squared. And then it actually looks like I'm missing one term. Negative 3y times 3x squared is going to be negative 9. Can I draw? I think I can. Let's see. I am missing a term right there. So that should be, I make mistakes, sorry. Uh, negative negative 9x squared y. Okay. Now, I leave a little spacer, just like I would if there was a 0 there. I could put a 0 right there. And now I'm going to multiply 2x to 4y squared. 2x to negative xy and 2x to 3x squared. Now, because I'm missing something, this term right here is wrong. Sorry about that. But ultimately, you get this is going to be a negative 9 and a plus and a negative 2. That should be a negative 11. So x through, uh, 6x cubed minus 11x squared y plus 11xy squared minus x uh, minus 12y cubed. All right, a square of a binomial means takes the binomial and write it twice. And now we can use the FOIL method. 4x times 4x is 16x squared. 4x times negative 6 is negative 24x. Negative 6 times 4x is negative 24x. And negative 6 times negative 6 is positive 36. Combine like terms, I get 16x squared minus 48x plus 36. Now, there is a shortcut. The shortcut of the squares of binomials look like a plus b quantity squared. The result is going to be a squared plus 2 times ab plus b squared. If it's the subtraction, the difference of squares, then it's going to be a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. And if you have one positive here and one negative, so a plus b times a minus b, that's going to pop out a squared minus b squared. Because we have these, this ability to know what the outcome is, let me jump up to the other uh, the example that we did up here. Because I know that this is a the square of a binomial, what I could have done is said 4x squared is 16x squared, negative 6 squared is positive 36, and then 4x times negative uh, 6x is 24x times 2 is negative 48x. That's our shortcut. I didn't have to FOIL it. I could use this setup down here to be able to jump to the answer. Now, if you don't remember our shortcut, foiling will always work. All right, let's change gears a little bit and talk about how we can utilize what we've been doing into a real problem. Let's take revenue. Revenue is the total amount of money obtained by selling items. So you take the price of the item, you multiply it by how many you sold, and that's the revenue. Let's say X is the number of items sold. I don't know what I sold, but I'm just going to call it X. And P, I'll say, is the price of each item. So we can condense this. R equals number of items sold times price of each item. We can condense that down to X or R equals X times P. Now using this formula, R equals X times P, let's give them an example. A store sells memory sticks for home computers. Known from past experience that it can sell X memory sticks each day at a price of P dollars per memory stick. 
according to the equation of x equals 800 minus 100p. Now this is a given to us from past experience. They figured this out, that they can sell this many given this price. We want to write in a formula for the daily revenue. Remember, the daily revenue was R times X times P. R equals X times P. We are given what X is. We know what P is. Well, P is just the price. Therefore, we're going to put it all together using the R equals XP. So R equals XP, where X came from our information, 800 minus 100P times P. Don't forget, X is this whole entire thing. Now I'm going to distribute this P. 800 times P is 800P. Negative 100P is negative 100P squared. Now we can figure out what will be our revenue at a certain price. For example, if our price is $1, 800 times 1 is 800, minus 100 times 1 squared, well 1 squared is 1, and 100 times 1 is 1, so our revenue would be 800 minus 100, which is $700. Oh, but could we do better? Let's try if price is $2. If our price is $2, then, let's do my exponents first, that's 2 times 2, which is 4, that's 400, and 8 times 2 is 1,600, so 1,600 minus 400 is 1,200. I did better. In the first circumstance where the price was $1, I, my revenue was $700. When the price was $2, then my revenue was $1,200. Now there does come a point where it's the top amount of revenue I can make. There will be a price where at a certain point, people will no longer buy your product. So you wanna try and find that magic price point. So let's say my price is $10 for this memory stick. Well, P squared is 100, so 10 times 10 is 100. 100 times 100 is going to be 10,000. 800 times 10 is 8,000. 8,000 minus 10,000, well, that's a negative 2,000. The price is too high. I don't make any money. In fact, I lost money. So the magic price is, well, I know it's not, uh, it, it's not $10. That's too much. We want to find the price that it's the maximum amount of earnings. And we can keep putting in prices less than $10, because we don't want to go over $10, that we'll find that magic price point. Of course, if we sold it for zero, we'd make zero dollars. We'd probably lose money in, in the long run as well. But any price we can put in there and figure out what our revenue is going to be. I'd say give it a try. Put in some values for P and find out what R is. Now you might be wondering, well, how do I know how many memory sticks I'm going to sell? Well, that was already taken care of from our past experience. So our price now only involves, our, our, our equation now only involves revenue, R, and our price. That's it for now. Until next time, be seeing you.